this room is dedicated towards understanding wealth inequality, but more structural inequality than anything. What has enabled wealth inequality to continue? What has enabled the wealth gap to keep widening? And so we start off here in the room by seeing the faces of our presidents from 1994 up until presently. And they are placed here because they're really gatekeepers, gatekeepers to the wealth that exists. And part of that is because of the decisions that they made in terms of policy making. We've seen neoliberalism as a big theme within this exhibition. And the report mentions that as well in terms of the decisions that they made that put profits before people when the transition was made from the apartheid government to the new political dispensation. So first, the major political source of corruption bracketing off the economy for the moment is that politicians have unchecked powers of appointment, promotion, and dismissal. There's some philosophical background here. The theory of modern government is skeptical of the motives of people who govern. Certainly there are good people in government, but the problem is that we can't be sure about this. So the theory of modern government invented the notion of checks and balances to cover for this. Checks and balances work by setting offices up in such a way that they are controlled by different people with different interests, but where each is reliant on the other to achieve their goals. What that means is that each has an interest in checking and balancing the other. We're all familiar with the notion of divide and rule, or checks and balances are how the people divide and rule the government. We tend to think of checks and balances at the level of the overarching constitution, for instance, as checks and balances between the executive the legislature and the judiciary. Within the executive, however, the public administration itself contains an elaborate system of checks and balances. Most important administrative processes are divided up into stages with different people controlling each stage so that no single person or group can control the whole process and corrupt it. Known as the segregation of duties, when corruption happens in South Africa, it usually starts with the politician using powers of suspension and appointment to place people across the stages of such a process, bridging the segregation of duties, cross-cutting checks and balances. The main reason why this happens is that the Public Service Act, the, the Municipal Systems Act, and the various pieces of legislation regulating public entities got rid of the key checks and balances and personnel processes, so politicians can now basically appoint, promote, and suspend largely as they see fit. South Africans tend to think that this is normal, but it isn't. In many countries, personnel processes are checked and balanced by independent civil service bodies like the Public Service Commission, by processes within the public service itself, and so on. Countries that don't have such, such mechanisms, like South Africa, tend to have much higher levels of corruption than, than countries that do. That's the first point. The second point is that corruption thrives in conditions of poverty and inequality. Where checks and balances aren't working, then we must rely on electoral accountability to stop corruption. Where there's high levels of poverty and inequality, however, that means that there's large numbers of people who are marginalized not only from the economic, but also from the civic and political life of a country. They often lack the resources and status to organize and engage as effectively as they could in the work of electoral accountability. Moreover, where politicians have corrupted government, they can also make access to state distributed resources dependent on showing political support. Where popular opposition emerges, corrupt politicians can buy off popular leaders with jobs, contracts, and other benefits drawn from the state. In this way, they can divide and rule popular movements. Poor people who rely more heavily on state distributions are especially vulnerable to this sort of move. This leads me to my third point which is that corruption works to entrench poverty and inequality. There's an argument doing the rounds in South Africa that corruption is a result of class formation, that it creates channels of upward mobility in politics for poor people. On this view, corruption reduces inequality. Certainly, some people upwardly mobilize through politics, but unfortunately the, unfortunately, the vast majority don't, and politicians have no interest in facilitating that. Rather, Politicians tend to prefer to create large numbers of small benefits. They create part-time and below minimum wage jobs, like, they, like in the expanded public works program. 
they split up contracts, making them smaller and shorter term so they can continuously allocate and reallocate to larger and larger numbers of people. They do so in a way that is calculated to ensure political support to hit off popular threats to their rule. Corruption, in other words, is a way to govern poverty and inequality and the patronage networks that it forms tend to trap people in low paying and uncertain occupations, subject to political opportunities with little real opportunity for upward mobility. Moreover, corruption tends to undermine the functioning of administrations that are needed to, to facilitate broader based and more sustained development. So how do we resolve the corruption problem in South Africa? Well, there are two technically simple ways that are, very, that are politically very complicated. We start empowering the Public Service Commission to manage appointments to the higher levels of key departments. We need to turn these administrations towards state-led development and redistribution that is rights-based, impersonal, and free of political opportunities. In the room entitled Deeds, there are a number of elements that we use to try and capture what uh, or how the structure of our economy functions such that uh, economic and gender inequality is produced. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these elements. You have to come watch the and see the, the exhibition yourself. However, I am going to talk about a few of these elements. First, I must say that the inspiration of this, uh, of entitled deeds, comes from the, the sense or the feeling that um, many of our wealthy tycoons have, which is that they can, you know, amass this great wealth, they, right, um, as in how they do through outsourcing, casualization, some of the things that we've spoken to about, uh, expropriation, all that stuff. And then do their little side hustle where they uh, use some of that money towards the philanthropy to do some good deeds, right? Uh, for, to the economies that they are actually impoverishing because of their privilege, right? So part of their entitlement comes from their ability to do that. And uh, one example of that um, is Rupert, Johan Rupert, who gave away some title deeds to a community uh, in Stellenbosch, a township community in Stellenbosch. The whole question here is that given that you amass your wealth in these ways that we speak about, is that um, the, the, that title deed, is that really trans transformative? Right? Are you really doing your best to mind your privilege and to uh, redistribute your privilege to those uh, who would need uh, support and, and, a, and a fair start in life. So this is really a spin on that. So as you enter the room, you are met by a room gate that has the faces of both current and past presidents. Uh, and, um, and then also there's a security guard that's there that's dressed in some retail security guard almost outfit. What is very important to note about this retail company is that they have the largest pay gap in the country, such that their the gap between the, the highest paid employee and the lowest paid employee is like a thousand times over, right, uh, in terms of the, the, the wage gap there. So anyways, you're met by these characters, right? And what you, and what that boom gate represents, I mean, you're already thinking, okay, we are in an estate, some kind of gated community. And that boom gate basically represents the amount of protection that government through macroeconomic policy has actually afforded these wealthy elites, right? And so as you enter the room you, and go past the boom gate, then you see, um, a couple watching TV and the movie that they are watching is Pretty Woman and I must say that the, the couple that 
is a mixed race couple. So they're watching this movie, Pretty Woman, which is of course a very famous movie. Uh, many of you have probably seen it. And we use this movie as a way of explaining what financialization is, because it actually does very well to explain what this phenomena is. Although we only see the Cinderella type uh, storyline, but there's more to it than that. Who of you have heard of the movie Pretty Woman? What is Pretty Woman about? Pretty Woman is on the surface a Cinderella story about an investment banker who pays for the services of a sex worker to keep him company while he's away on a business trip. After a week of spending time together, which includes shopping sprees, a night out at the opera, being sexually harassed by the investment banker's lawyer, and almost breaking up, they end up falling in love and we are led to believe living happily ever after. What if I told you that there is more to the story of Pretty Woman than what we think? A side of Pretty Woman that is often missed is its story of financialization in the late 1980s. This is a story of financialization told through the lens of Pretty Woman. What is financialization, you may ask? In the following clip, where Vivian and Edward are having breakfast, we learn about some of the key features of financialization. Vivian's character acts as our consciousness as she asks Edward about what financialization is. These are some of the things that we find out. I was uh, working last night. You don't sleep, you don't do drugs, you don't drink, you hardly eat. What do you do, Edward? Because I know you're not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There are four other chairs here. So what do you do? I buy companies. What kind of companies? Well, I buy companies that are in financial difficulty. If they have problems, you must get them for a bargain, huh? Well, the company I'm buying this week, I'm getting for the bargain price of about one billion. A billion dollars? Yes. Wow. You must be really smart, huh? <laughs> I only got through 11th grade. How far did you go in school? I went all the way. Your folks must be really proud, huh? So you don't actually have a billion dollars, huh? No, I get some of it from banks, investors. It's not an easy thing to do. And you don't make anything? No. And you don't build anything? No. So what do you do with the companies once you buy them? I sell them. Here, let me do that. You sell them? Well, I don't sell the whole company. I break it up into pieces, and then I sell that off. It's worth more than the whole. So it's sort of like um, stealing cars and selling them for the parts, right? Yeah, sort of, but legal. One. It involves financial actors, markets, and institutions. Edward, an investment banker, uses his skills to borrow money to the value of one billion US dollars from lenders that include commercial banks, pension funds, and insurance companies. This act of borrowing is known as raising or mobilizing finance. Two, it involves financial engineering or the use of maths to develop a financial product that can be bought or sold for profits. Although not discussed in this clip, an investor such as Edward could raise the finance he needs by selling junk bonds to lenders in exchange for the loan to the value of one billion US dollars. A junk bond is an IOU, which promises to make a lot more money for the lender than what they lend. But it is a very risky bond because there is a high chance that the borrower, in this case, Edward, may default or not pay back what he owes the lender. Three, financialization involves financial motives. In this example, the goal for mobilizing this finance is not to invest in the long-term activities of the firm. Example, 
buying machinery and equipment in order to gain profits by building or making more goods and services better. The goal for mobilizing this finance is to make quick profits by betting on the value of a thing. In this case, the value of the company, once it's been bought, broken into smaller pieces, and each one has been sold off in order to extract its value in a lot of cash. Five, Vivian makes two important observations about what Edward does. You don't make anything. You don't build anything. And what you do, it's like stealing cars and selling them for the parts, right? To which Edward responds, it's all legal. People like Edward, that is, investment bankers, started to grow in numbers when the illegal things that they were doing to make money started to become legal. They took advantage of loose restrictions on the way that money markets, pension funds, insurance funds, and commercial banks can invest money. Pension funds and commercial banks could now start investing in risky IOUs like junk bonds, which opened up people like Edward to a lot of loan money that they could play with to steal cars and sell them for the parts. Five, therefore, these financial motives, actors, institutions, financial markets, have an impact on how well economies do. The impact of financialization on economies is best captured in the next clip. Here we see Edward, Vivian, Mr. Lewis, and his grandson, David, at dinner at the Voltaire. In the exchange between Mr. Lewis and Edward, we see a tension in their view of the role of a firm in the economy. Mr. Lewis, my grandfather believes the men who create a company should control its destiny. Where's the salad? The salad comes at the end of the meal. But that's the fork I knew. Let me uh, put it another way. Between your public statements and the rumors flying around on this thing, we find it very hard to figure out what your real intentions are. I don't know about you, but I've never been able to figure which goes with what. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there was a time when we built ships the size of cities. Men like my grandfather made this country. Who ordered this? The gentleman did, ma'am. Bon appetit. These are escargot. It's French for snails. It's a delicacy. Try it. David? Mr. Lewis, if you were to get control, and I don't think you will, but if you did, what do you plan to do with the company? Break it up and sell off the pieces. I'm sure you understand I'm not thrilled at the idea of your turning 40 years of my work into your garage sale. At the price I'm paying for this stock, Mr. Morse, you are going to be a very rich man. I'm rich enough. I just want to head my shipyard. Financialization, seen through Edward's eyes, has redefined economic activity and the firm. A firm is no longer seen through Mr. Lewis's eyes as an institution made up of people, resources, and processes that combine to make things that are then bought in exchange for more money. Through Edward's eyes, a firm is just a stock or a share that can be traded or exchanged for more money. Therefore, financialization worsens the big separation that is already present between the workers of the firm and the things that they are contracted to produce, because the purpose of the firm, as seen through Edward's eyes, is just to maximize as much value or profit for the shareholders. While financialization can be good for shareholders and investment bankers like Edward, because they earn lots of money, Financialization is not good for workers, the unemployed, and the economy at large, because the economy is turned into one big garage sale. Workers lose their jobs, firms are bought and sold just for a quick buck, and there is little long-term investment in companies that will employ people and grow the economy. This results in low economic growth and high unemployment. In South Africa, 
we also started to relax our laws and policies that govern financial markets. We made it easier for money to move around so that people like Edward could shift their money from South Africa to America and back to South Africa again in a week. We thought by relaxing our laws governing these markets, we would be able to attract people who are more like Mr. Lewis, that invest over the long term, building companies that will grow and employ people. Instead, we got people like Edward, who were just interested in hit-and-run investments, investing in the South African economy in the short term, and then pulling out. We got many people like Edward because they were attracted to our high interest rates thanks to policies like inflation targeting, which they could use to make lots of money. How they did that is a story for another day. However, people like Mr. Lewis, in an environment of high interest rates, could not survive because their borrowing costs were so high, and banks stopped investing in them and began to invest, like Edward. Therefore, companies owned by the likes of Mr. Lewis started to shut down, or they began to act like Edward in order to make quick bucks. For instance, they could use financial engineering to dodge paying taxes by moving money into tax havens like Panama. This is what Steinhoff did. Or they can use financial engineering to dodge paying workers their wages. This was also made worse because they had to compete with products coming in from other countries. The winners of this financialization are the investors, the speculators, the top 1% or 10% of economies around the world. The losers are businesses that are built to last, businesses that have a long-term horizon and not quick money and speculation. The losers are workers, the unemployed, society at large. That's the story of financialization told through the eyes of Pretty Woman. Oxfam South Africa's report calls on the South African government to do the right thing for an inclusive economy, free from financialization. This means, one, a macroeconomic policy targeting full employment and not inflation targeting. Two, controls are put in place to limit harmful hit and run investments. Three, a financial sector geared towards long-term productive investments. This should be done through regulation, such as the separation between commercial and investment banking. Four, state-led development of a large green industrial development bank that finances productive activities at different scales. So I think what is key here um, is that our economy looks more like Edward's vision of the economy. It looks more like uh, a garage sale, thanks to financialization, right? Uh, I think there was someone in a workshop that called it the Mashamisa economy. Um, uh, that, that's a good way of, of perhaps conceptualizing or thinking about financialization. Um, now, what's important to note is that the likes of um, Edward have amassed their wealth, or even this mixed race couple, have amassed their wealth through um, macroeconomic policies that have um, supported financialization or this Mashamisa economy, right, post-1994. And what is important is that it's not only governments, but like our government, but this is actually a global architecture. The global system works in this way. And so you are met uh, as you enter the room uh, next to the bed by a lampshade. And the, the tassels of this lampshade uh, are written World Bank, International Monetary Fund, Moody's, Fitch and, and the rest. 
And these are international financial institutions that have been very key in giving us enlightenment, in enlightening us on how the economy uh, and how economies around the world should be designed and should be fun uh, uh, and should function. What they've actually done is ensure that uh, this macroeconomic framework that supports financialization is uh, implemented across countries, right, by force. <laughs> um, whereas, our, of course, our uh, country actually, uh, they quite embraced and accepted this, this um, or at least the ruling elite at, at that time embraced and accepted this, this kind of framework. And this enlightenment uh, is called the Washington Consensus, uh, because many of these institutions that I'm speaking of are actually based in Washington, uh, where this doctrine uh, kind of uh, emerges. So what is key here is that um, the, our, the, our capitalist couple, mixed race couple, are supported by these types of institutions, the fact that they can amass their wealth in the way in which they do because of this Washington consensus, which is the enlightenment uh, through which our macroeconomic policy is framed. It's also important to highlight is that, you know, these tycoons, once they amass their money, they can spend it and they spend it in various ways they want, right? Uh, they buy private jets, they go on holiday, and in fact, what you see is a picture on the wall, uh, a holiday destination, uh, which is an island called Panama. Now, what is significant about Panama is that it's not just a leisure island, right? Panama is a tax haven. This is where the rich uh, use financial engineering tricks to not pay taxes where they would have accumulated their wealth. So in South Africa, they probably don't pay taxes and they'll decide, actually, we know that the tax rate is 28, the, the corporate tax is 28%, but we'll make sure that we pay um, uh, 11%. So what, that, what ends up happening is that workers aren't paid the amount of money that they are meant to be paid um, uh, because they will make it as though the business is not doing well to pay wages through financial engineering and then they will ship their money off uh, and we won't be or we won't be able to get um, money to where is it is needed such as in education in healthcare in roads in water and sanitation and then they put their money up in in panama so that that for us is quite key so that these these types of links are made. Perhaps the most controversial part of the scene is this mixed race couple. As we you will remember or recall, there's a lot of collaboration that happen, happens to set up the system. There's the collaboration between the state and capital, there's the collaboration between business, IFIs, the government, and all these collaborations that, ha that happen to maintain the status quo, right? Now, there's also the collaboration, of, obviously, within business itself. And the way in which that has happened in this country is through black economic empowerment. So that couple basically is representative of that. And it asks us a very key question, which is, has this been really transformative? Because you see that the black uh, business person uh, is also enjoying the spoils of wealth, right, by using the same mechan similar mechanisms, right, to that uh, others use, right, whether it is outsourcing, casualization, financial engineering, and all that stuff. So in this space over here, we're looking at the informal sector, informal trading, and we represented that through photography, which we have over here. And we're really looking at the role of retailers or even multinationals and how they are impacting how informal traders are working. So something that we usually think of when we think of informal traders is usually from the lens of police brutality. But we, what we don't usually do is consider the role of corporates. 
for me, the informal sector is huge, and yet people look down at the informal sector being a small entity, and um, uh, they, they, they don't take people very seriously, especially people on the ground, because they're poor and they're fending for themselves. It, as we are now in COVID-19, we can see that uh, it, it has a huge impact on them because now we've got more people coming because they are unemployed. So that is going to bring the numbers even bigger. And the challenge is huge because people don't have money at the moment, even to buy from the informal traders. So our issue is huge as people think it's just a nothing. But we are, we are feeling the impact because we can see business is down. There's, there's no money. People don't have money to buy things anymore. So we're feeling it. It's harsh. And then also with the 350 then we thought we could stay at home. But unfortunately, we're fending now for our families to come back to work during COVID, which we were supposed to be holding, having social distancing, which we see that social distancing, especially in a, in a taxi ring, you can't call a taxi ring, an overcrowded taxi ring, and still have a social distancing. What are you talking about? We are crowded in a taxi ring, never mind what the impact of us getting into the taxi with 100% people, 100% uh, full, I mean, and there's no social distancing. So we as, a tra as informal traders, we are heavily impacted because we're trying very hard to put food on the table, nevertheless trying to transport ourselves without having any money. There's no train system, the train system is in tatters. We see people are actually now living informally on the online. They're living online on the rails. So you can see our situation is getting dire. Mm. So for me, I, I, I don't know, our challenges are huge. Okay, so maybe just tell us a bit more about whether you are consulted or not when decisions are made regarding the informal sector. Um, participation is very poor. Uh, not only do they not call the public, they do not even call the relevant stakeholders, which are the organization that represent the informal traders that would know where they issues are, like for instance, service delivery, issues with the office, issue with the illegal, uh, issues with traders not being registered, or are, are rather uh, being put on the database. That is our challenges we have on a daily basis, because people are not sure uh, who they must go to, who they must see to. They always look, at, they look up to the representatives, but we, our hands are very short. We can't even go into those things, because it, uh, the city officials are the ones that are in charge. They hardly come to the office. They come maybe, maybe I think once in a while to the office. They, they run two markets at the same time. I don't know how can an administrator or manager run an office at the same time while he's supposed to be in one market. So the thing is, there's always this blame game then. The traders are not sure what's going on and they become very loved and sometimes they even take it out on us as representatives that we are not doing enough. But the challenges are huge because we are never consulted over anything. Even if there's any decision making, we're never part of it. We are always alienated. And when it comes to the service del delivery issues, when it comes to the, cons when they're structuring the thing, they never get to us and tell us what are we gonna construct or what are we gonna do. They just come up with, up with upgrades and then they put this on to us without us knowing what's going to happen really. The scope of work is never given to us. We never see it. We just, we just, they do everything behind closed doors. So obviously the public is gonna have an outcry because they are not, part, they're not participating in these meetings. Things are always done in their own way. And for us as, the, as representing the traders, although we are supposed to be there, we are not there. Decisions, we're not part of decision making. And we, we're not saying that we want to, to do everything, but at least call us and tell us, is this needed? Is this not needed? What should be done? And so that the traders are, you know, that, that they are, although we know they can't keep making us all happy at the same time, because we will have illegals all the time. But for me is, what happens to the database? Because they are in charge of the database, not us. Even when they do demarcation, it gets done through the DED and the Janus Property Company. So, the, uh, I mean, not Janus Property Company, DED and um, what the, the other organization, the JMPD. They are responsible for demarcation. So we have to rely on the, the Department of Economic Development for all those things. So even if we want things to be demarcated, demarcated we can't get it done because we have to go through so many chal uh, challenges. I, and, and for us, we can't really speak to the officials because they follow orders. They don't follow us. We are just 
uh, how can I say, we are ignored all the time. We are not consulted. Uh, the only time they hear us is when we start doing the toy toy, and then they see us, we really mean business. But for the moment, the, the informal sector has been ignored. So what are some of the solutions that you'd like to suggest? What, rec what can you recommend? What would you like to see actually happening differently in the informal sector? Well, firstly, um, because we are in a, in a space where public is walking around and uh, we are with, in, with the uh, taxis, um, we have very little space. We don't even know sometimes where we must even walk because our places are so small. Right now, they are going to build the taxi range. I mean, they're gonna pro there's a new project coming up and it's still gonna be, they're still using the small space. For me, I'm trying to figure out if they are going to restructure the taxi range mm -hmm. on a single space where it stands at the moment. How is it possible that they're going to provide all those things for the other traders? That means traders are still gonna be outside. Mm -hmm. Millions of rain has been spent and no, we never see the scope of work. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So we want accountability and transparency, and they must do it now. We don't want to hear anything about this or that. We want accountability, because 75 million rand is a lot of money. But playing such an important role in yes, contributing in, yes. to the, and the to economy, economy, and especially taking care of uh, mothers, taking care of their children, and the, educating their kids with this very same money and looking after their family. This is most vital for any informal trader. It's their livelihood. Mm -hmm. This is all they have. They don't, they are unemployed. And more unemployment is, gonna, is still there. More people are gonna come into the informal economy. So people can't say it's a small little thing. It's huge. Over here, we have a work by Tommy Mutsuai. And this is courtesy of him, Tommy Mutsuai, as well as his daughter, Joyce Mutsuai, and Dalro. So they gave us copyright permission to use this particular work. And he did this piece back in 1985 during the, the state of the emergency in South Africa. And it was a reflection really on how retail giants um, have been uh, just regarded as so important um, rather than what's happening around the world or around the country at the time. So people were more interested in just going shopping and going, on, uh, going about their usual lives. And the, the piece is titled, OK is Everything, actually. And it's quite, we included it here because it's again just speaks to this looming role of the retail giants in this country and how people had just keep going on about their daily lives or daily existence, but don't realize how much of an important role that they've been playing in entrenching inequality still. So we put this here alongside these works called um, forced removals. Again, this whole, uh, this whole installation is forced removals. So what we've seen here are retail giants such as ShopRite Checkers, as well as Pick and Pay, for instance. And they have gone about and bought a lot of Paza shops that have existed in particularly township areas and they have rebranded them according to their own brands. But in the process, what they've done is they've made it difficult for informal traders to operate efficiently. They've made it more difficult, increasingly difficult, for informal traders to make a living. And these images depict that, and we found it quite powerful in that they show particularly uh, work, people go, just going to buy the um, now branded You Save store, for instance, and an informal trader working outside. In another image we see at the Jablani Mall in Soweto, we have informal traders who were pushed out while the mall was actually being created and no space was created for them to work. They didn't have ablution facilities, for instance, um, but one of our speakers will speak more to that. And yes, we just found it very interesting to show the, the two sides of the coin that exist in terms of this type of inequality and entrenching inequality here. Over here, we have just a work showing or depicting the retailers who are in a winning position in this checkout part of our check-in, check-out installation. And what we'd like as well is for 
our visitors to the exhibition to contribute solutions that, that could make a difference in terms of how we deal with inequality, in terms of challenging policies that exist. So we'd like people to contribute that and share those with us over here in the space. And to wrap up the whole um, exhibition, Oza came up with a number of recommendations, which you can find in the report, in terms of solutions that can actually be taken um, in response to all of the problems that have been pointed out. So these are some of the positives that we can take going forward, or these are some of the changes that we can make. For example, a living wage and a cap on minimum income. Implement a package of progressive macroeconomic policies, for instance. Fiscal tax justice. Tackling political and corporate capture. Gender accountable and just budgeting and planning. Recognize, reduce, redistribute unpaid work and care workers to be represented in policy decision making. Implement industrial policies that prioritize the creation of more and better jobs for women. Enforce labor protections for democratic and fair workspaces. Reverse labor reforms that attack working class organizing. Protections, fair, safe access to markets for informal sector and universal basic income grant. So these are powerful recommendations by Oxfam South Africa and they can be found in the report. And as a social justice consultancy, I think that they've come together with, they've come up with some um, powerful ways of tackling all of the issues that we've highlighted throughout this exhibition. And I do hope that the relevant people take note of that and that going forward that some of this is implemented, if not all of it is implemented. Thank you so much for joining us everyone. We do hope that you enjoyed the show. Thank you to Oxfam South Africa. Thank you to the Workers Museum. Thank you to all of our participating artists, our exhibiting artists. Thank you to the team that helped us put everything together. Thank you to the speakers who were here to join us today. And we do hope that you learned a lot more about the different types of inequality, the intersectionality of inequality that exists, and that we do hope that the artworks were a true reflection of the, the work that the, Ox, that the Oxfam South Africa report is doing to raise awareness about this inequality. So we do hope to see you soon, but otherwise please do follow Oxfam South Africa on their various social network platforms. And thank you very much. My name is Pumzile Nombuso Twala. Thank you.